So I'm delighted to be here on campus of Columbia. Um, I just want to let everyone know, uh, full confession, I am a Columbia brat in that my whole family, um, my father, my brother, my nephew, my sister-in-law, all, and even my mother have some Columbia connection. And I was the black sheep of the family, going off to MIT <laughs> and then Carnegie Mellon. But it's, I, I always enjoy coming back home. I grew up at the steps of the alma mater, playing at the steps of the alma mater. Um, so it's nice to be here. So I'm going to talk about some of my favorite topics today. I put them all together in this talk on what I call cyber trust meets um, cyber physical. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, as we go along. So first, we are living in a world of um, highly interconnected devices. Um, this Internet of Things is a promise that will come. And all the data that will be streaming from these devices will be analyzed and visualized in the cloud. And all these devices and the cloud will be very much a part of our home, our work, and the physical environment. So this is, a day, this is a world that we live in. Um, we already have thermostats and lights that learn when to go on and off. We have um, cameras that monitor when our babies are uh, crying, when we're not at home. And we have robots that clean our houses. And we can imagine the world of tomorrow where at our fingertips or through gesture, we can control and even program these devices. So that's the world that we uh, can anticipate. We have cars that are driving themselves on the roads. And of course, self-driving cars um, are transforming uh, the whole automotive industry. We have drones that are going to deliver packages from point A to point B and go to places that humans uh, don't usually go to to see what's going on um, in remote areas. We have contact lenses that can continuously monitor our glucose level and tell our doctors um, how we are doing in terms of if, our, uh, if we have diabetes. We'll have pills that we ingest that will um, release the drugs on time um, and be more efficient in terms of uh, curing or treating our symptoms. And of course, we have the world of uh, sensors and actuators in the environment, whether it's on farms or in buildings like this. Um, and this is, we're going to see more and more of this uh, in the future. We even have robots that um, are at work serving at the, in the cafeteria or in clinics, working as nurse clinicians. Um, my favorite robot is the one in the middle. That's my colleague at Carnegie Mellon, Manuela Veloso. She invented and built and designed these cobots. And cobots are unique in that they're robots that know what they don't know. And so when they are in a situation and they are stuck, they turn to the human, who hopefully is next to it, and asks for help. So this particular cobot, for instance, doesn't have an arm or a finger. So when it gets in front of an elevator and wants to take the elevator to go up and down, it turns to the human and says, would you please press the elevator button? And then it, the human cooperates. The robot rolls onto the elevator and so on. So it's, it, and this is uh, at Carnegie Mellon. There are four of these cobots that have been roaming the halls um, for years now. And we even have these cobots attend faculty meetings and <laughs> uh, um, basically they're telepresence robots. But it's very convenient. Um, OK, and then we imagine the day where people who um, have disabilities can, with new devices, actually do things that they can't today um, because of these smarter interconnected um, uh, technologies. So imagine now the world where at home we have all of these devices interconnected, and they're connected outside in the physical world with other devices. And of course, there's a cloud sitting on top where all the data is being collected, analyzed, visualized, and so on. So this is kind of the world of the future. Um, 
What is common to all of these devices? What is common to these systems? They all have a computational core that interacts with the physical world. Cyber physical systems are engineered systems that require tight conjoining of and coordination between the computational, the discrete world, and the physical, the continuous world. And so I actually started a cyber physical systems program when I was at the National Science Foundation in around 2008, and it's still going on. It was joint between the computer science directorate and the engineering directorate, but now it has grown beyond those two directorates because of the recognition that it's not just cyber physical systems, um, uh, cyber talking to physical, but it's in the presence of humans and society and the grander um, challenges and opportunities that these systems uh, provide uh, in terms of their implications for um, people and, 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 and society. So the trends for the future are, first of all, cyber physical systems will be smarter and smarter. Um, and, these, and the smarts will be in software. And the smarts will be AI, machine learning, um, data analytics. So more and more of the intelligence will be in software. And there's going to be more connectivity and data flow uh, between the devices, between the devices and the cloud. And the fourth is the recognition that we can't design these devices and IoT and cyber physical systems, even self-driving cars, drones, and, and you name it. We can't design these systems without paying attention to the human element. We can't design them without paying attention to the implications they have with respect to how they change social norms. Privacy, for instance. So what could go wrong with these cyber physical systems? Let me just show you a little video of what could go wrong. So let's hope this works. This is my favorite. <laughs> so that's a drone job. future where they will become much more part of commercial enterprise businesses and so on in terms of their own way of actually delivering uh, packages and so on. So it, then we have to really take them seriously as they become a part of the physical environment. Much like we have to take very seriously these self-driving cars or cars that 
can drive themselves with some human in the loop still that are on our roads today. So when I talk about cyber trust for cyber physical systems, this is the picture um, that I like to think about. <clears throat> when I say cyber trust, I mean reliability, security, and privacy. And so well, how do we think about reliability of these cyber physical systems, security of these cyber physical systems, and the privacy implications? And again, it's about not just the hardware, not just the software, but about the people element as well. So what I wanted to do for each of these, reliability, security, and privacy, is just talk about some of the research challenges that each of these uh, 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 properties for cyber physical systems or cyber trust um, have to meet. Um, and, and some of my, uh, some of the challenges, I have a feel, I, I have, have a sense of how the community is addressing them. Some of them are quite open. And so I, I always like to give talks at universities where there's students in the audience because these are potential thesis, thesis topics. Um, and if you're undergraduates, you can still do research and are working with, uh, I, I'm assuming that it's true at Columbia, you can do undergraduate research. So there's a lot of juicy questions I'm going to ask. And these are all big questions um, that suggest potential thesis topics. So let's start with reliability. And I'll just say that, um, I'll just outline three challenges. One is these kinds of cyber physical systems where you have a computational core that, interact, that interacts with the physical world. Um, in the end, when you want to reason about the correctness of these systems or reason about the safety of these systems, reason that that drone is not going to crash into a person, or reason about that self-driving car that's not going to hit an obstacle in the way, then the mathematics you need um, is a combination of discrete and continuous. So we need a way to reason about the discrete and the continuous at the same time. And in my own area of research, my early area of research in formal methods and verification, um, we have come a long way um, in building tools and techniques and mathematics and logics for reasoning about discrete systems. And of course, in all of engineering and physics and applied math, um, there's a, you know, decades or centuries of, of ways to reason about continuous systems. But what we need is a way to reason about the two at the same time. So what has happened in the past is we have these verification techniques that are uh, called hybrid verification, whether it's in the tool or the logic or the technology that allows you to reason about both. So we have come a long way in formal methods in reasoning about the safety of these cyber physical systems. And what I wanted to do is give you one example of, uh, and not, it's actually not my work, but uh, I'll, I'll talk about that. The second challenge is also prevalent in, in any system that's going to have to interact or operate in the physical world. Um, and that is reasoning about the uncertainty in the environment. So this uncertainty minimally is due to Mother Nature. Things happen, hurricanes happen, tornadoes happen. And how can you possibly design a system that can withstand these disruptions due to Mother Nature? Again, the engineering discipline has very much studied this problem. That's why our bridges still stand up. That's why our cars still drive, even though it's windy outside. Um, but computer scientists have not studied this as much. They have studied it, studied it certainly in robotics, where the robot has to move in an unpredictable environment. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, a technique that we're doing at, at Microsoft Research that speaks to this. And finally, another challenge in terms of reliability is sensors and actuators can actually fail. So um, I'm not going to talk about how we can address that, but what I really wanted to share with you in this slide is there are a lot of challenges um, to ensuring the safety um, and correctness of these cyber physical systems. So let's start with a technique that 
um, a, a, a student at Carnegie Mellon, who's since, um, at, I think he's at MIT as a postdoc now, um, has been studying in terms of hybrid verification, reasoning about the continuous and discrete at the same time. And he rediscovered um, a few years ago uh, Turing's paper on computable reals. So I, I never knew this until, uh, I was on the thesis committee, that's how I know this work. Um, a real number is computable if its digit sequence can be produced by some algorithm or Turing machine. The algorithm takes an integer n greater than or equal to 1 as input and produces the nth digit of the real number's decimal expansion as output. And there's a, been a lot of, um, research in, in, in mathematics on computable reals, so I'll just state a, a fact here. Um, while the set of real numbers is uncountable, the set of computable numbers is only countable, and thus almost real numbers are not computable. So the point really is, well, there are a lot of real numbers out there, and we don't know how to compute them. So, um, so this is a real verification challenge. Um, and the point of this slide is to say, oh, a real number A is said to be computable if, it, if we can approximate it by this function. Um, and so given any integer and greater than or equal to 1, the function produces an integer k such that the real falls between those two expressions. So that's, we know this from math, if you will. Um, but how does that help us? It doesn't really help us from a verification or computer science point of view. But the good news is the computable numbers, the computable reals, include many of the actual reals we care about. So um, uh, e and pi and transcendental numbers. So this is a good news for the verification people because then we can represent the, the reals that we care about um, and then we can actually do some verification um, using these computable reals. So, that's one example of how the research community is attempting to reason about the continuous and discrete at the same time. It's still ongoing, uh, an ongoing area of active research. What about reasoning about uncertainty? So we have a project at Microsoft Research where uh, we are looking at drones and we are actually looking at delivering not packages but other uh, other things um, and um, the the way in which the team is approaching the verification problem is to look at the layers of the stack in the system the drone uh, all the way from the operating system so we actually have a secure real-time operating system we have homegrown it we have verified it with respect to memory safety um, and so that's our foundation of the OS. It's secure. And then on top of that, we have, of course, sensors on this drone uh, and cameras and so on. And if there again, you want to make sure that the data that you're sensing um, is, is good, the data that you're, uh, that's coming in is good, that the cameras are correct. Um, and then up above that is control. So you actually want, uh, for instance, a drone with a quadcopter, for instance, has four um, rotors that you really need to control independently, and, but you want the whole drone to be stable as it's flying through the air. And finally, at the high level, you have a mission for this drone, for instance, to transport package A to B, so you need to plan the route for that drone in order to, first of all, avoid any obstacles, but also um, withstand any wind and other um, nature conditions that happen as the drone is flying through. So we have, um, a, last summer, uh, we had a summer intern work with us uh, on, I'm just going to focus on the co correct control uh, layer in the stack. Um, and looking at the system as a state, so there are some number, 12 different state variables that we care about, and control. And those are the four quadcopter, four control variables, each one in, um, uh, associated with each of the rotors. And so you can imagine now putting state and control together, um, and then you need to model the environment. 
So we have um, a logic that we invented. It's called probabilistic signal temporal logic that allows us to talk about reasoning about um, state and control, but in a very unusual way in that we actually bring in a Bayesian classifier to help us give us some confidence into whether the state, whether we um, think the state of the system um, is um, good or bad with respect to the classifier. So what am I saying? I'm saying that we actually um, take uh, we actually want to have, build a classifier to determine whether the drone, for instance, is um, too close to the wall. So we have you know, sampled a lot of points that we've used to train a classifier to say, um, well, if you're at this distance, you're too close to the wall. If you're at the, at this further distance, you're not too close to the wall. And then as the drone is flying around, it uses its sensors to determine, am I too close to the wall or not? And so that classifier is in, is in the logic. But even before we get to that, we have basically this um, optimization problem. We want to minimize the cost of deviation from reference, which is the point in space where the drone is, and the cost on control. So we have an equation or an expression here that we want to minimize. This is the deviation from uh, reference, and the second term is control. But we want to do, th this is all control theory at this point. But, so this is the continuous world. But now we bring in the, the um, discrete world. We want to do this subject to the, a safety property, which is a logical formula. And that's what's on the right hand side. So we have a behavior of the system, which is simply um, the state variables x and the control. And then we have this particular behavior over time, the sequence of uh, state and control variable. And then we want to make sure that particular behavior um, respects the property um, in describing this uh, temporal logic. So that's, that's the verification um, that we need to do. I'm not going to show you the logic. That's a whole other talk. Um, but I have that on my uh, laptop as well. So now that was reliability, uh, just a brief hint as to some of the challenges in making these kinds of cyber physical systems safe and secure. Um, so next is security challenges. Um, and so we've already, we already see a lot of press articles about how uh, easy it is, unfortunately, to um, break into these systems um, through physical means, through social engineering, and we've even seen some pretty scary events, and uh, whether it's breaking into a nuclear reactor control system because of a USB drive, um, and, and you name it. And we, we have um, examples of uh, you know, groups of people or individuals who really do know how, for instance, to break into our um, uh, power grid infrastructure. So this is, these are real threats. Um, and how do we secure ourselves? How do we secure our infrastructure? How do we secure cyber physical systems more generally against these kinds of attacks? So that's the big question. And it's, it's a, a hard problem, or a growing hard problem, because the number of devices is growing, and the number of types of devices are growing, and their interconnectivity is growing. And all this interconnectivity is also dynamic. So we have, for instance, a hacker here, and it, it might, that was a fast <laughs> simulation. Let's try that again. OK, here we go. So you, the, the real point about Internet of Things, cyber physical systems, is that the attack surface has grown. The, the attack vectors have grown in number and type. And so we now have to th start thinking from a cybersecurity point of view, um, what is my attack surface, and what are the new kinds of attack vectors that we've just introduced because of these new kinds of devices and because of the interconnectivity. And by the way, there's a cloud there as well, <laughs> just to make things more complicated. I'm going to get to that when I talk about privacy. So 
One challenge is how can we protect each device from the network which might have been hacked or which might be transporting some malware to infect me? And how can the network protect itself from each device which itself might, be, might have been hacked or might be spitting out malware? So there's, it's, it's, it's a two-way view of where the protection um, has to lie. So we, in practice, already know how to build somewhat secure systems in a very straightforward, typical computer science way of approaching uh, a problem, which is layers of abstraction. And again, we start with some notion of the identity of the device, and we can build that in hardware. And then from there, we can build a small footprint of an operating system to boot uh, this, the whole system up securely. Uh, we need to store that key in some secure store. And then we can start building encryption and building security protocols on top of that. Finally, we have to configure the system. And finally, we get the applications on top of that. So from a systems point of view, we already have an approach, a methodology, for building uh, layers to provide security uh, to the applications at the, at the top. So why don't we um, take this method and, and apply it to um, a world where we've got small devices? Um, and I think the first and foremost that I, that's going on around in the community, especially in the uh, business community, the corporate community, is to uh, get everyone to agree that device identity uh, is, is critical uh, and has to be part of the device in hardware. And from there, then you can build the entire stack. Now that's all said well and good. However, these devices are often resource impoverished. Low battery, um, not a lot of storage, maybe not a lot of processing. So the challenge is how can we build the security stack for resource impoverished devices. Um, and we have a very interesting um, project that I uh, just funded at Microsoft Research, I call Intelligent Devices, which is looking, for instance, uh, at how to split these machine learning models that people are producing that were running in the cloud, but how do we split them between the device and the cloud? Because if we want intelligent devices, if we want smart devices, these, the smarts are, uh, should be living, some of the smarts should be living at the devices. And that will save the latency and bandwidth that you, um, are, would incur in, tr in, in uh, the communication between the device and the cloud. So this is ongoing research as well. And actually, it's the algorithms um, researchers who are driving this particular project um, at Microsoft Research in, in intelligent devices. So that's one challenge. So let's pretend now all our devices have been secured and we also pretend that we know how to secure the network, which is also a big pretend. Um, <laughs> but what about the cloud? So that's also a big one. Now, there are not that many companies that run clouds, uh, but Microsoft is one of them. And we worry a lot about um, providing a trusted cloud. And so that really is the um, billion dollar question. How can we trust the cloud? Um, and you and I already in, uh, interact with the cloud, perhaps with, without your even realizing it. Um, probably the mailer you use, the mail is stored in the cloud. Um, certainly a lot of the documents that you write and compose and edit um, can all be done in the cloud. So why should you even trust the cloud? Um, as a consumer, there's no real reason to. Uh, these companies like Microsoft publish certain privacy policies and say, you know, please trust us. Um, and I bet none of you read those privacy policies, but you do trust the cloud providers, um, and probably for good reason. 
Um, but I want to convey to you that behind the scenes, there actually is a lot of good reason to trust these cloud providers. So that's what I want to speak about. When I think about trusting the cloud, I think about um, <coughs> the user providing lots of the cloud um, operators user data. And so trusting the cloud means trusting that the cloud operator is using the data only as promised and storing the data in a way that no one else can see your data. So that's part of the trust agreement. Um, but so this is the this is a set of privacy challenge, challenges that I see um, that technology companies like Microsoft um, needing to provide um, for earning customer trust. So again, why do we care about privacy? We have devices like cameras that are monitoring um, babies at home. Um, and we have had horror story after horror story where these cameras have been hacked. Um, strangers are able to shout at the baby through these cameras. And, um, and the parents may or may not even be home. And uh, they're cute horror stories for now. But you can imagine um, how severe this problem can uh, become as more and more of these devices are in our home um, and in the privacy of our bedroom and so on. So what do I mean by privacy? I have um, thought a lot about how there are different uh, disciplines that come together in uh, thinking about privacy. Of course, computer science, um, statistics, um, but it's about law and policymakers and ethicists, philosophers. Um, all of these different disciplines have thought about this topic of privacy in the past. And I have been encouraging the science and technology community to come together with the policy, law, and ethics communities to talk to each other um, to address these privacy questions um, more holistically. So I think of privacy as the appropriate collection and processing of information about a data subject by a data <coughs> holder and the flow of information um, between data holders. And by appropriate, there's where we um, appeal to our social scientists, our philosophers, our legal scholars, our ethicists, and so on. So it's of social norms, context, context of use, ethical values, company policy, legal rules, and individual preferences. And this is why there's so much debate about what do you mean by privacy. Because there's no agreement on any one of those, universal agreement in any one of those, of what is private, uh, what does privacy mean? What is private to me? may not be private to you, may not seem that it needs to be private to you. And so e each individual has a different privacy line. And, and we see this quite often at Microsoft because we try to do um, good, um, but it may be that um, you, you need to draw the line somewhere. Um, so this is an active area of research right now. Well, what companies, of course, try to do is avoid the creepiness uh, factor. Okay, so if we think about just data, and there's much more to privacy than just data as I showed you, but if you look at the data life cycle uh, in terms of data comes in, data is collected, data is managed, stored, analyzed, um, and then data is possibly shared with others. Uh, and the analysis gives us insight. This is from data to knowledge to decision, from data to knowledge to action. Um, and the sharing allows the individual partners doing the sharing to gain insight that they otherwise could not get were the sharing of data not there. Um, but the sharing does um, uh, raise the, the question of whether now that 
I have data that I didn't have before, I can actually reveal the identity of someone um, because of this additional information. So in this data life cycle, of course, we're required by law and also by company policy and by social norms to preserve certain privacy policies. And this is, this is the state of the world today. It, privacy is primarily, in, in, the, in the real world, uh, is primarily driven by policy and law. Um, and so my whole uh, area of research and, and my interest in privacy is why can't we as scientists and engineers come up with technologies that can help uh, light up new scenarios that um, are, would free us from being bound by the constraints of policy and law. And there are examples of this, and the last example I will close my talk with is, is, is such an example. So I've been promoting the use of technology to underlie um, the policies, of course, but also to enable new scenarios. Um, so that's, that's my personal, that, I had a whole talk prepared on that topic. Um, okay, so what I'm gonna do is go through uh, a couple of, well, one, one example in detail of how we can use technology to help us in this picture. So right now, what we do know is this. What we do know is that when you're collecting data, the first instinct of collecting data or uh, publishing a, uh, a, 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 a database for public consumption, the first instinct is, well, if you want to preserve the privacy of the individuals in that data set, you anonymize the data set. Um, and what we know is anonymization doesn't work. So there are, um, again, numerous stories, and probably the most famous one is the Netflix prize disaster, where um, we learn that in any particular data set, if you try to anonymize it, the reason it doesn't work in today's world of big data is when you have auxiliary data aside with this data set that you anonymized, you can often re-identify individuals in that anonymized data set. And so the, the fact that anonymization doesn't work has actually been elevated to the level of the White House that put out a data privacy report a year and a half ago, I believe, um, where there's a lot of discussion about how companies and organizations um, and, and including universities uh, sh shouldn't, shouldn't fool themselves into thinking that if we just anonymize the data set, then we can go off and do our uh, great uh, work because of this re-identification um, possibility. So I think some of you in the audience know one technique that has addressed this particular problem, and that's called differential privacy. And that technique, um, and, and uh, co-invented by uh, Cynthia Dork at Microsoft Research, um, uses statistical um, foundations for arguing this privacy uh, property called differential privacy. I'm not gonna talk about that, but what I want to say is that a lot of research progress has been made in addressing the fact that you should not anonymize, uh, think that you're preserving the privacy of individuals by anonymizing your data set. So what I am uh, going to talk about is this second, um, uh, this middle uh, uh, challenge, which is I now have a lot of data, say, in the cloud. And I've promised to the customer that I will only use some of the data for um, maybe spam detection, but I'm not going to use this data for target advertising. Or I might promise the customer that after 10 days, I'm going to delete certain information. So I make all these promises to the customer. And then the question is, why should the customer believe um, you know, these promises? And so what I am going to talk about 
is using some pretty standard computer science techniques to do policy compliance. But one of the things that I alluded to earlier is if we had new technology, that privacy preserving technology, we could light up new scenarios um, and actually change policy. And this has to do with this red box here. Um, the, 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 the policy of, that we promised our customers at Microsoft actually stands in the way of different business groups within the company of sharing data with each other. Um, it's, and it's because we actually do make these promises to the customers and we don't want to um, have this problem, you know, actually uh, have the problem I, uh, uh, I just described where if you have two data sets that you're uh, now unioning or sharing with each other and you can re-identify uh, an individual. So what happens um, certainly within Microsoft is that people just don't share data with each other. So this is a good thing for, for you to, to know behind the scenes. Um, but this also means that there are opportunities, business opportunities that are missed because you can't share the data. And the best example that all of you can appreciate is if we had um, a larger data set, um, then that means more big data. And that may mean a better model that you can, a um, machine learning model that you can train. And so the, without the ability to share data, you may not actually have the best, say, machine learning model that you could produce. And so there's that, that balance. And so um, I'll get to that example in a second. What I wanted to talk to you about is, um, so this is, this is a differential privacy is out there. Um, however, there's still a challenge in making this notion practical. And the other is, in some of these new encryption protocols that we've invented or the community has invented um, using homomorphic encryption or secure multi-party computation are wonderful tools uh, that can um, help uh, do some privacy preserving of, of our systems, but they also need to be made more practical. But what I'm going to talk about is this middle bullet here on how we do privacy compliance. Uh, and it's, it, it's based on techniques from programming languages, static analysis, dynamic analysis, and plain old computer security. So the question is, how can we do privacy compliance for big data systems? So companies like Microsoft and Google, of course, run these big data systems, these big MapReduce-like jobs. And, um, and these companies also promise their customers um, certain privacy policies. And so um, internally, I can tell you that the work that I'm just about to describe is actually used at Microsoft um, on our big data systems. So this is real. Um, so here's a scenario. Typically what happens is you have a policy, it's written in English, in some, usually written by lawyers, and you have the privacy champion who interprets this uh, document uh, with respect to privacy, and then you have a, the, the coding team. They write millions of lines of code that are supposed to abide by the privacy policy. And then you have uh, a question of, do, do this, does this million lines of code actually abide by this English privacy policy? It's standard verification, uh, verification question. So what happens is, how do we do it today, uh, typically, in, in most companies? Um, we bring in the audit team, a bunch of human beings who look at the lines of code, try to interpret that, and see if the lines of code abide by this English language privacy policy. So this is, you know, this is this is what happens today. So this is um, how do so how do we really do this? Well, we have lots of meetings between the legal team and the privacy champion, and then we have lots of meetings between the privacy champion and the developers, and then lots of meetings between the audit teams and the developers. And so this is very human intensive. And, and lines of code are being written 
every day, lines of code are being changed every day. So how can you ever hope to keep up with this? So this is in a, in a big data, big system world, this is reality. <coughs> so what we, were do, what we were able to do is formalize the English language policy into a language um, that can be machine readable, but also still human readable. Uh, we call it the specification. And then we use verification to do the compliance checking. And what we're, we can do this at scale. Um, and we can do it for all the data that's collected and managed uh, in our big data systems. So the streamlined audit flow is then we write a formal policy specification in this legalese language. Um, and then we, um, uh, then we use a pretty much um, standard techniques from program analysis, pr programming languages to run over the code and look, basically build up a graph. And then what we can do is analyze the graph with respect to this formal policy language, check it to see if it complies, and if there are any um, you know, discrepancies, then we can spit out to the audit team a list of problems to look at. And that's what we do today. So, um, what I'm going to do is very briefly go through what legalese looks like, just to convince you that it's actually human readable, um, and but 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 extractable easily from an English language policy document, and then very briefly show you how the uh, analysis of the code works. So here is a the legalese uh, um, specification of the Bing, Bing is Microsoft search engine, of the Bing privacy policy. So in the, on the right hand side, we see all the things that we promise the customer in English. And on the left hand side, you see the legalese, so the, all the formalism. And it's you know, pretty, straight, uh, pretty straightforward to do the translation. Um, and let me just walk you through um, one example policy. So, this is a policy that I extracted from the previous slide. We will not use full IP address for advertising. The IP address may be used for detecting abuse. Um, in such cases, it will not be combined with account information. So this is what the lawyers wrote on the right. Okay, And without a lot of effort, you can imagine if you know what the keywords are, you, uh, uh, and the ontology in general, you can imagine translating this right-hand side language into something more formal. And that's what the left-hand side is. So we um, first deny at the upper, uh, on the uh, very top, we always do a deny that I, the IP address uh, can be used um, for advertising. That's this is a formal language now, but you can see that it corresponds pretty much to the English. Um, except we will allow a truncated IP address um, for abuse detection, um, except in the case of um, a, a combining, we don't ever want to combine IP address and account information. So you can see it is pretty much um, straightforward to do the translation. So in terms of uh, and there's a formal you know, semantics to the language uh, for the computer scientist in the audience. Um, OK, so now what, a, what about the code itself? We can actually divide the code into data sets that each process consumes, and then the processes that do the transformation from one data, to, uh, one data set to the other. And this graph represents the flow of information through the system. And what we can do is we can annotate the code and the data with certain policy types. Um, and then, uh, so there might be name, age, IP address, and so on. And then run um, static analysis techniques over this graph with those annotations to detect violations of the policy. So that's, that's um, pretty straightforward. This system that I described runs nightly. On, at Microsoft on our big data systems um, because we, it's, it runs over millions of lines of code. 
Um, and so what's interesting is actually I was visiting um, the NSA uh, a couple years ago, and I met with their uh, privacy team. It's a very, at the time, it was a very small team, a windowless <laughs> suite of offices. And the head of the privacy team you know, was sitting here, and she had a copy of our paper with yellow highlighted um, sections because she saw that this work could possibly scale to any organization that has a lot of data, that has to uh, promise their users, um, in this case the citizens of the United States, that their privacy policies are um, uh, complied with. So she was pretty amazed that you know, a company like Microsoft could do this at scale uh, in basically nightly. Okay, um, I'm not sure that should be on the videotape, but anyway. Uh, okay, so I want to close with one, uh, this one challenge which the research community is making a lot of progress in. And this is the question of how can mutually distrusting parties share data sets to benefit from their union? And let me give you a scenario. So imagine you have different clinics and hospitals, um, and each one has patient data. And we have rules that, and, and also practices, that say that these hospitals should not share their patient data set with each other. So these hospitals have to keep their patient lists separate, and the information about these patients separate, and so on. But as Computer scientists and as people in, interested in healthcare, we know that if we were able to share some of that information across all these patient data sets in a way that will preserve the privacy of the individuals, then we could maybe um, you know, build a machine learning model that can classify better than today's classifiers because we have so much data available to us. So that's the um, dream, uh, but how do we do this in a privacy-preserving manner? So there are uh, two techniques that one can use, and at Microsoft Research, we're actively pursuing both of them. Um, and I think that there's a, a lot of expertise at Columbia that in cryptography that could p potentially also be pursuing this. And so um, one answer is to use crypto. And there are long-standing algorithms, secure multi-party computation, um, that basically, uh, if implemented and if practical, uh, can light up this scenario. Uh, the scenario. And uh, this is an active area of research. And we actually had a demo um, at Microsoft Research where, um, uh, oh, okay, so I'll, I'll just go on to the, the second. The second approach is actually using new hardware that's coming out. Um, and these are, um, uh, uh, for instance, Intel is coming out with, or has already come out with a processor called SGX. And SGX has a set of instructions that allow you to build what's called a secure enclave. And what you can do within an enclave, what happens is think of um, you know, this enclave as an iron box. And within the enclave, you can run uh, normal code. And, um, but outside the enclave, you cannot see what the computation um, is. And most importantly, all data outside of the enclave is encrypted. So no one can read the data. So um, using this or using secure multi-party computation, you can implement what we call secure computation, which is computing over encrypted data. And once you can compute over encrypted data, then you can do these kinds of scenarios. So that's, that's really a hotbed of research activity right now in this particular space for privacy and uh, ensuring trust to the customer by cloud providers. Why is this so interesting to um, companies like Microsoft from a policy or legal point of view? We would like to be able to um, have the customers 
give their data to us in the cloud, and we would like to be at all, it's all encrypted, so we can't read the data. Um, we'd like to be able to um, run computations on behalf of the customer um, on encrypted data, and we furthermore like to be able to say when, for instance, the government comes to the company, and, um, and we'd like to be able to say, we don't have the keys. The customers have the keys. If you want the customer data, you have to go to the customer. And so that's what all of this is, you know, trusted cloud is aiming for. Um, this is, of course, a very timely and hot topic <laughs> of debate right now. Um, I am not a policy person, but I very much understand the policy implications of this technology and what it could um, do if we light these scenarios up. <laughs> so I'm going to stop there um, and just say that I am, my dream is that we can build cyber physical systems that people can bet their lives on. And what do I mean by bet their lives on? It's because these systems are reliable, they're secure, and they're privacy preserving. So thank you very much. <laughs>